Welcome to our latest NCAA Social Series, episode 38. I'm Andy Katz. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Derek Gregg, the new Senior Vice President of Inclusion, Education, and Community Engagement. Uh, it is a long title, but it's an important one. Uh, uh, Dr. Gregg, I, I want to get into your past, your athletic career, your athletic department career, and then the job at hand. But first, um, the overall task that uh, has been uh, empowered to you. What do you think it is? Well, it's an amazing, incredible responsibility. And it was a long process, as you can imagine, during the interview process. But one of the things that really stuck with me was uh, Kevin Warren, who's the commissioner for the Big Ten that everybody knows. But he chaired this search. And he told me in the, my last interview, which was actually at the NCAA office, that me being the athletic director or the vice president for athletics at the University of Tulsa would basically be my last job if I took on this responsibility. And he said, this won't be a job, this will be you helping lead a movement. And it's interesting, uh, I was always interested in the position, but once George Floyd was killed, which was about a week after the job was posted, this responsibility took on another meaning. And what was going on on the campuses uh, across the country, I ended up chairing the, uh, the racial equality action group for the American Athletic Conference. And so a lot of the things that the student athletes were saying, how they're feeling about different things, which is very important, and, and they are a key voice in this movement. Uh, but the world just shifted. And so I think this went from being a, a great diversity and inclusion position to probably one of the most important in all of higher education. And, and I really feel like that. So it's a great responsibility. And, and uh, I, I look forward to all the work ahead. All right, so wow, you gave me a lot of launching, uh, launching points here um, that I'm gonna just talk it just for a moment because there's a lot I wanna dive into there. But let's first go back uh, your career uh, as a football player at Vanderbilt and as you moved up the, the chain as an athletic administrator. Um, I think we're roughly around the same age. So we're in the same generation um, playing at Vanderbilt. What was life like for you then uh, as a black student athlete and the world in which both of us, you know, I think we're in college around the same time. Well, and, and I'll start even with growing up in the household I grew up in. My mother actually helped integrate a high school back in 1965 in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm from the deep South with, uh, it was 30 black students in a campus that was 1900 students. Huntsville, Alabama, 1965. And so she's a pioneer and I've always been a pioneer almost everywhere I've gone for better or for worse, including Vanderbilt University. And when we got there, it was interesting that um, we were included, my football class, it was the first time they had ever brought in that many African-Americans in one class. And it was only 12 of us. And so I think though that we outnumbered all the other African-Americans that were on the team at that time. So it was interesting. It was, a, it was a guinea pig moment that we didn't know what was that was happening. But fortunately for me, I was surrounded by not just the black, great black student athletes, but everybody on that team. And, and you know, we weren't that successful on the field. Vanderbilt, everybody knows that we've struggled some historically. But the, the greatest education, the greatest educators surrounded by some of the best and brightest in the world was just an amazing experience. And so it really helped catapult me in, into the first parts of my career. And, and I'm sure we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but I've been involved in college athletics now for the past 26 years, my entire career. Uh, and when I went to Vanderbilt University in 1988, it's interesting, I haven't left campus since then. I've been on a campus almost every day of my life for the past 32 years. And so now coming into the NCAA office, this is the first time I've been off campus, but still, very uh, heavily involved with what's going on back on those campuses. All right, so if you went in 88, I went to Wisconsin 86, so I got you by two years. Um, and, uh, and I can tell you, uh, my memory is that black students at Wisconsin at the time, and I'm curious if this was similar to Vanderbilt, you know, were basically the athletes. And even at the student newspaper and things that I did, there was no representation. And that was an issue, and still is an issue. What was it like in the greater campus when you were at Vanderbilt in the late 80s? Well, it was similar to that. We, we probably had a few more 
students of color, they had what they call the posse program that was developing at the time. I think that's very popular across the country now. So they did a good job of that and they still do a good job of that. I think Vanderbilt in the past couple of years just had the largest number of minority students come in in one class. And so they were intent, they've been intentional about that over the years. But back when we were there again, just 12 black football student athletes coming in in a class when typically across the country, it's much higher level than that. And so I do credit them for some of the things that they've tried to do in the past years. But again, it was deep south and not only just from a racial standpoint, but just the socioeconomic status um, and some of the separation back then. And, and I came from a household that we didn't have a lot coming up. And so um, I, I always tell the story of how when I went to Vanderbilt University, I only had three things. I had a football scholarship, I had a Pell Grant, and then I had a car that my mom found somewhere about a week before I went to school that only lasted for about two and a half years while I was there. But uh, I had an incredible opportunity. And I said this in a trustee meeting at Tulsa, and, and it's come full circle now to come full circle 30 years later to be able to be uh, in the position that I am. I can hold my own in any, any room in athletics really played a major role in that, in Vanderbilt Athletics in particular, even though I wasn't surrounded by a lot of people who looked like me at the time. So that was probably the case as you climbed up the athletic ladder around the country in administration. And what struck me right off the bat when you mentioned the job search for this one was you said Kevin Warren, you know, led the search. Um, across the country, and I don't need to, I don't want to, and I'm not intending to disparage these um, headhunters, but the majority of them are white male run. And uh, for jobs in athletics, uh, if everyone is leaning on various search committees, and you may have had to do that when you're athletic director at Tulsa, um, you know, there aren't as many headhunters uh, and search committees led by people that look like you. And that's a problem. I'm curious, first off, how you solve that, and two, how that, you know, how you dealt with that as you climbed the ladder in your own career. Oh, absolutely. It's so, it's so much in that, that question. And obviously, having been an athletic director and been involved in college athletics for a long time, I know the majority of the search firm representatives, and, and they're great people. But, but you're right, there's not a lot of diversity there. There are no African Americans in higher uh, levels, senior levels at any of those firms. So first, I would encourage them and, I, and I'll be doing a lot of this to hire more people of color. That's the first thing. You have to have some type of representation, uh, in particular, if you're going to try to help solve some of the problems that we have related to hiring. And then in number two, when people sit in the chairs that I've sat in, when you're the athletic director, you do need to remind uh, the search firms and everybody else involved with the search that you want a diverse search uh, uh, hiring pool. And, and required that in your searches. And I did a lot of that. When I was at Eastern Michigan and at Tulsa, I, I did hire people of color. I hired uh, women also as head coaches. A lot of people know that uh, we have far more men involved in, in head coaching now on the women's side of the house and women's sports programs. And the number of women has began to dwindle. So we have to pay very close attention to that, be mindful of it, and also continue to remind those first search firms what we want because the search firms work for the schools. It's not the other way around. And, and it, although they're very helpful, they're very knowledgeable, they, they've done a lot of these things, but still we have to be responsible and remind them to be responsible as well. So how often, I'm curious, um, because I've talked to plenty of coaches, uh, coaches of color who have felt at times that they were the token interview, you know, that an athletic director said, okay, I have to at least interview one person of color and sometimes they knew that going in but they wanted the experience or maybe they wanted their name out and they were okay with it because they knew sort of the new knew the rules of the game how often did that experience happen to you well it happened to me a lot but you know I, I have great mentors and I agree with everything that those coaches are saying and sometimes you do get into a search and you almost know that you're not going to get the job from a historical standpoint uh, there in some schools and I've been told at times behind the scenes, well, that school just wasn't ready for a black athletic director. And so you have to deal with that. Gene Smith, who was a great mentor of mine, he told me one time that before he got his first real major head, uh, athletic director job, which I think was Iowa State, he interviewed at least seven or eight other times 
part of it is that you're doing an audition for the search firm. So you have to get and work those relationships and those people have to know you. And then you want to interface with those presidents when you get deep into those searches, whether they hire you or not, they could end up being a president somewhere else. They could recommend you. They could be at an institution that's not so-called ready for a person that looks like you, but they could still be an advocate. And so I do agree with that, but I don't think that we can back away from those opportunities. We have to put ourselves in those rooms and interface with those people, uh, do the best job that we can in the interview, and then hopefully someone will notice that and uh, we can get ready and, and be ready for the next one. And, and I, I wanna be clear that uh, this goes across the spectrum. Exactly what you said, it blows my mind, but yes, we're not ready for a person of color. We're not ready for a woman. We're not ready for someone who's Asian American or who's Hispanic. I don't know why you're not ready. Get ready. I mean, this is the world we live in, but yet that gets said uh, quite often. You know, I want to go back to one thing that you did at Tulsa that I thought struck me um, and really is a poor reflection on American education uh, because I think the Tulsa massacre is one of the least taught American tragedies um, really in the last, you know, 100 plus years. Uh, and for you to draw attention to that as the athletic director at the University of Tulsa, I'm curious, you know, how hard was that? How ready was the Tulsa community to look at its past and to say, you know what, we need to address this. I want to honor this through sports uh, in, a, in a way that also can educate. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think, I didn't know anything about the Tulsa massacre until I came here. And, and at first, in the past few years, I've been here seven years, I was there seven years, it was labeled as the Tulsa race riot, which almost means that there were two factions fighting against each other, but there really wasn't. This was a massacre, a surprise attack, and wiped out a very prominent African-American community that has never bounced back. That's the shame of it all, not just the people getting killed, but the financial disparity that was caused by the situation. And so, what really, and, and this is across the board too, we mentioned George Floyd in the beginning. I think that situation really spurred a lot of what's going on now. There's been more attention brought to it, but also we're coming up on the 100 year anniversary of it. And so I think maybe if there hadn't been such a milestone, maybe people could have kept it in the background. But more locally, here at the University of Tulsa, we had an administration that really embraced this. Uh, we had our first legacy game this year and and for me they they tricked me honestly and i did not know uh I, I didn't plan on going to the game i planned on being in indianapolis but they told me that i would be giving the first legacy award to someone that i'm very fond of one of the assistant coaches uh coach fletcher aaron fletcher who's going to be a great head coach one day uh, a lot of this was his concept and so they told me i would end up giving him the award he wouldn't be able to come up and get it i couldn't go down on the field because of COVID and all those things so we did it up on uh, another part of the stadium, but when they turned on the lights in the video, it was about me. And I was so stunned and humbled by this. And they named the first award after me and they gave me the first one. And so I'm very proud of the fact that going forward, they're going to have this game every year. They're going to recognize somebody in the community. But again, I was very surprised by that. I didn't, I, I always like to give and give back and, and never look for accolades like that. But that's something that I remember for the rest of my life. And so I'm glad that I've been able to play a small role in that in providing more coverage and, and about what really happened here historically. And next year is going to be a big year. Uh, 2021 is going to be a big year and there will be a lot of events and a lot of commemoration of it. And, and I look forward to taking a uh, part of that too. Well, congratulations on a wonderful honor as well. So look, let's, on the practical sense, um, campus by campus. So you have straddled now both worlds. Um, especially in the high profile sports. And obviously you could argue that men's college basketball has done a pretty decent job. It, it's been peaks and valleys in hiring uh, uh, head coaches of color and certainly assistants could always do better. And there's certain leagues that could definitely do better. Um, women's basketball is doing better as well. Um, football, big problem. And there needs to obviously be a much better feeder system, if you will. And then as you talked about uh, athletic directors, and high level athletic department officials. What's the sort of the granular level, the way in which you can get down on that grassroots? Uh, we talked about search committees. What's another way that you can help facilitate more diverse pools and hopefully create more diverse hiring? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because we have something that we're working on right now. 
uh, the Leadership Collective, which is actually going to be rolled out in January because of the holidays. We actually, and Dee Dee Merritt, who is the Director of Leadership Development at the NCAA office, gets a lot of credit for this and other people. Peter Roby, who a lot of people know, he's the former athletic director at Northeastern, who was just inducted to their Hall of Fame. He works with us as a consultant. But this is basically going to be a way to house all of the information for those candidates, uh, in particular candidates of color, on the coaching side and on the administrative side. And a lot of times what you hear is uh, people in leadership roles, whether it's presidents or other people, they say it's hard or difficult sometimes to find very qualified people of color to fill these roles. And so we're going to be at the grassroots level of that with a database that will house all of this information. It won't just be a name that you click on, but there'll be videos that, you know, with technology today, you can do so many more things. And so people get to introduce themselves to people on video virtually and, and some of the things about them, because a lot of times when you get to that level, and I've been in a lot of those rooms, when you get to that level, it's not so much about skill. We already know that the person coming in the door has the X and O skill. It's about the fit. What are they like? Uh, what is their past like? What's their coaching tree? They don't get a chance to explain all these things and put all these things in the database. And so people doing the searches, including the search firm people, can populate things. If it's they want a coach who's had 10 years of experience uh, or if they want a, an administrator who's had 10 years of experience, who was uh, the administrator for the sport of women's basketball or men's basketball, point, click, and those people will populate and make it very user friendly for even people like myself, I'm one of the least tech savvy people out there, but this database is something that we're really, really excited about. We think um, candidates will be very, very excited about it. And to me, it's something that will help make the jobs of the search firms and the presidents and other people, athletic directors, much easier. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, one other issue I wanna address is um, the eight point plan to advance racial uh, equity. Um, in what way do you think you can help shape it, change it, direct it, um, you know, going forward here? Well, first of all, I want to commend the staff for being able to put that together. And that was driven by the senior management team at the NCAA office. And, and I don't know if I mentioned it in the beginning, but Mark Emmert doesn't get nearly enough credit for assembling what I think is probably the most diverse senior management team and president's council in all of higher education. And I've never been in, around anything like it. I worked at six institutions Personally, I've been on three or four president's councils, and then I've worked throughout conferences and I've seen a lot of the president's councils and I've studied these types of things. So he's done a fantastic job with that. And that group helped shape the eight point plan. What we're doing right now is enhancing it. And, and some of the things in particular with the student athlete voice, and that's part of the eight point plan, making sure that that remains very prominent. I'm looking very forward to getting, once we get past COVID, getting back onto the campuses. That's going to be a main focus of my job. I'm going to be very external, going back to talk to student athletes about their experiences, making sure that their voices are heard on the social justice side, uh, culture, everything going on with them in their sport and, and how we can help improve their experience. That's the number one thing. As an old athletic director, I'm very, very interested in that. And, and then another part of the eight point plan is that we want to have at the end of the year, uh, next year, probably a consortium or a symposium of sorts to bring a lot of people who have been working in these spaces. That's the NBA, the NFL, a lot of people here in Indianapolis, the, the, the fever with the WNBA, the Pacers, the Colts, obviously, a lot of people around the country, professors, diversity and inclusion officers on campuses, so we can start to look at and re-examine best practices. We've been very reactionary in the past few months, which has been great because I've been a part of that. But now as we start to move into the future a little bit more, using the student athlete voice in their opinion, how can we craft action steps to move forward uh, with this entire movement? And so that's what, and I tell people, I'm not excited. I'm just really motivated right now. I'm really compelled to be here. And, and again, being the first time that I've been off campus, this, this really is has always been something that I've been very passionate about. I've mentioned my background and I'm just looking forward to moving us forward in the future. Well, I think that's great because um, I think for years there's been this perception that, you know, Indianapolis people didn't know who, you know, where the face is, who it is. It's just sort of this, you know, four letters and no one knows and to have more faces out there 
communicating in an external, especially people like yourself who have actually been on campuses and know plenty of people in the space, I think will help tremendously and really touching um, when we can, you know, physically uh, shake hands or hug again, um, you know, the student athletes and the coaches and, and you know, reach out uh, to those in, involved in all of this. All right, so two other quick things. One is um, the Russell rule, Bill Russell. Uh, the WCC, Gloria Navarez, uh, who's a trailblazer in her own right. And she's the first um, Hispanic American who is a, a conference commissioner um, out at the West Coast Conference. The Russell rule, named after San Francisco Don, great NBA Hall of Famer, Bill Russell. Uh, what are your thoughts on that being implemented and hopefully being more widespread? Oh, absolutely. First of all, I want to commend Gloria on that and the CPCDE, the committee you mentioned that has uh, written her and did her for that along, along with the conference. And you have to have presidents and everyone else on board, but very, very supportive of the Russell rule. And we're talking about some things actually in-house with the NCAA, and I won't divulge too much. Um, right now, but we want to also be able to point to ourselves. We point to the, the West Coast Conference. That's a best practice. We support that. The CPCDE supports it. I think there was an ESPN article that was written uh, a few weeks ago, right after that last meeting, and I sat in on that. That said that that committee didn't take any action in adopting a Russell Rule, but that was not uh, a part of what they were supposed to do action on that day. And that body. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't move that way. You have to have, if we're going to have a, an association-wide Russell Rule, that has to come through the association. It has to come through the conference offices or be put into legislative form by the body, not that committee. So I wanted to make sure I cleared that up because some people were really, really confused by that. So that committee is very, very supportive of the rule. And uh, we're looking at some things internally with, from the NCAA standpoint. And again, we in the NCAA, we ensure that there's diversity in these searches, but I don't think that a lot of people know that. So I wanna make sure that we can codify some things and point to ourselves as a best practice because I don't think that you can put pressure on other entities or even push them in the right direction on best practices if you aren't a best practice model yourself, which I think we are in a lot of ways. We just have to make sure that everybody knows about it. And the last thing, Derek, that I think we've seen already this season, you brought up George Floyd's murder at the beginning. And we are now seeing student athletes empowered now more than ever. Um, they are encouraged to speak out. Um, I don't think a coach, at least it would be political suicide, if they were to come out after the fact and say, you know what, you shouldn't have spoke out, you shouldn't have said this. Um, you know, in today's social media, that coach is gonna get crushed if they do that. So now they're empowered to do that. And we're seeing student athletes certainly over the summer and the fall doing that more. And I, and I'm convinced once the real student bodies come back, whether that's spring or fall of 21, I think we'll see even more activism from student athletes. And then now we're seeing, you know, on the jerseys, um, not everyone, a lot of shooting shirts, um, you know, expressions, picking it up from the NBA and the WNBA, for example, the Big East did put BLM on their jerseys. How much from your new role, uh, maybe previous as Tulsa Athletic Director and now at the NCAA, are you encouraging that self-expression, whatever it may be. Well, that's something, again, with the student athlete voice, we have to encourage it and be very supportive of it. Now, part of it too is that we, I like to also help redirect or direct student athletes in the right direction. Sometimes, um, and, and it's interesting, Brandy Stewart, who is the SWA down at uh, UCF, was the co-chair of the committee I chaired there, the racial, again, the racial equality action group. And she made a great comment to a group of student athletes. And she said, listen, you don't have to yell at us about things we're already trying to help you with. And I thought that, that was just a great message. So trying to redirect some of the, the demands that you get from the student athletes to help them understand that, hey, this is pretty, a pretty good situation, especially coming from where I came from. And, and what's provided to the student athletes is so much more than what was provided when I was a student athlete. And again, we're going to do more. We're talking about NLI and some of those other things that could take another whole series within itself. So we can always do more. But to also help the student athletes understand that these are great opportunities that they should take advantage of and they should maximize these and get everything out of the educational process that they can. 
And so again, I, I'm very, very supportive of the student athletes, the student athlete voice. And I think as a whole, and, and uh, we should all be that way. But again, we should also try to help them understand everything that can be gained from being a student athlete. Well, Derek, I um, appreciate this wonderful, informative and educational conversation. I know uh, more than likely we will talk again uh, as you continue in this new role. Safe travels, be safe. Uh, this will wrap up this edition of our NCAA Social Series. As always, you can go to ncaa.org slash social series to see all 38, archi 38 episodes archived. I uh, will continue this conversation uh, every week right here on NCAA on all our social media channels. I'm Andy Katz. Be safe, everyone. We'll talk to you next time.